Powell with Western Cuyahoga Audubon and this evening we've got some really special guests to share with us information on uh, fall warblers, fall warbler locations, some highlights. This is to help us with our fall, fall warbler challenge uh, and the challenge is running right now from started September 1, runs all the way through September through October, the end of October. And basically the challenge is to make you a better birder, but to have fun as well, too. You just never know uh, what, what you see in your neighborhood, in the parks nearby, the lakefront. And that's what we're going to be learning a lot more about this evening, is a little bit about some ID, some locations, and, um, and a little bit more. So our, our Fall Warbler Challenge, like I say, uh, is two months. This, we're just kind of getting in the beginning of warblers coming through. Uh, I've been out several times and, you know, I've gotten a nice little list. Um, and uh, we, what the challenge is, is to get as many fall warblers in the county in which you live in that two-month period. So last week, uh, we had Ryan Jacob from Black Swamp Bird Observatory do a nice presentation on those confusing fall warblers, which we found out there's only about a handful that are really confusing. Most of them are pretty easy to identify. Yeah, right? so, uh, but this evening, we've got three wonderful folks. Uh, we have, oh, and if you are not muted, there you go, very good. Um, we have Tim Colborn, who's the president of Ohio, Ohio Ornithological Society. Tim, give a wave. There you go. Uh, Buster Banish, who's a teacher at East Clark Elementary School and uh, an inspiration for students called the Bird Nerds. And also Tim Jasinski, who is the Wildlife Rehabilitation Specialist at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. Give a wave there, Tim. All right. All right. Fantastic. And again, I'm going to send a quick reminder. Please keep yourself muted. Uh, our IT or our, our person who is running the slides will also mute you. Um, and we will give our full attention to our guests. So I guess, uh, Tim Colborn, you're going to be the first one to share information with us. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Thanks, Nancy. It's uh, great to be here. Um, glad to share the stage with uh, Tim and Buster, uh, two guys who I admire very much, and um, I hope that they feel comfortable jumping in on any of the things that I say because I feel when it comes to warblers, there are very few true experts out there. I think we're all sort of learning, continuously learning. At least that's how I feel about myself. Um, but um, hopefully we can share some information that will be helpful to those people that are taking the challenge or just want to work on learning warblers, um, where, when, how to find them, and how to identify them. So let's, uh, let's jump into this. Uh, that's a photo of a fall warbler, uh, a warbler that um, for us in northern Ohio, we, uh, we get to see uh, a, generally a, a late migrant. Um, uh, right now is a great time to start seeing these birds a little more frequently through the end of the month and into early October. Uh, this is, for those who might not recognize it, I think the, the fact that it's on a bird feeder might be a dead giveaway, but this is a pine warbler. Uh, a muted pine warbler. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to talk about um, is uh, when when should we be looking for warblers? And um, I think uh, for most of us, we know that in the fall, September is really um, the heart of the migration for warblers here in northern Ohio. But it truly extends really into the first couple of weeks of October. We certainly have warblers moving through in that entire month, but the numbers start declining end of September, mid-October. On those last couple of weeks of October and into November, there's still some birds moving through, but the numbers have declined significantly. Um, who are some of the early birds that have already started moving and maybe gone by now? We 
probably are seeing very few yellow warblers. Seeing yellow warblers now is uh, um, not unheard of, but um, this is certainly on the late side for yellow warblers. Uh, black and whites, the northern water thrushes, American red starts are just a few of those birds that move a little bit earlier through northeast Ohio. And then, as I mentioned there, uh, many of them start their migration in late August. Um, by early September and mid-September, chestnut-sided Tennessee gold-winged blue-winged warblers, those birds um, were maybe starting to see a, a, a some fewer fewer of those birds than we may have seen earlier in the month, um, but many of them are still moving through. Uh, I have seen golden wings reported in the last couple of days. I haven't seen blue wings reported. I believe that they're slightly earlier than the golden wings, but I think they're pretty close. But the golden wings have still are still being seen, but catch them while you can. And then there's a group of birds that um, really are uh, later in the migration. I've listed a few of those palm, orange crown, yellow rumps. I don't know that I have seen any of those three birds reported yet. I'm sure they have been, but I just haven't seen the reports of those birds. Um, but uh, this week, starting the next couple of weeks, we should start to see those birds in uh, larger numbers. And then finally, um, there are a group of warblers that include the three I've listed there, black pole, black and white, black to green, that have a longer duration of their migration from start to finish. They seem to stick around a little bit longer as they're moving through. Um, the early ones are perhaps a little earlier, the later ones are a little later. So instead of maybe a two or three week uh, time frame where we have a good chance of seeing these birds, it may be extended to five, four or five weeks where we have, uh, we get to see them. Black to greens, I remember, uh, reading reports early on in the migration, maybe late August, and we're still seeing reports and I'm still seeing photos on Facebook groups of black to green warblers moving through Northeast Ohio. Okay, next slide, please. I'm gonna cover just a few of what I consider to be my favorite Cuyahoga County uh, fall warbler spots. Um, none of these are going to be surprises for anybody uh, on this list. Um, the Lakefront Nature Preserve has become, over the last 10 years, one of uh, the real hot spots for uh, looking for migrants, both in spring and fall. And for me, it seems that the best luck that I've had uh, in birding for warblers it's been the hillside right there after you cross the bridge. For those of you that haven't been, when you walk into the property, you go through turnstile, you take a short little zigzag path, you go across a bridge, and you're on the perimeter trail. You're on the south side of the perimeter trail. Well, that perimeter trail kind of goes east and west, and on, uh, as you travel both ways, east or west, if you, uh, if you look to the south, you've got a little bit of a ridge with trees. Uh, it's very narrow. It's uh, probably not more than 40, 50 feet wide with trees and shrubs, uh, but it continues to be a very, very rewarding place to look for warblers and migrants in the spring and fall. And you can often find um, birders kind of just pausing along many of the spots in that area trying to find uh, warblers and uh, other songbirds. Uh, the rest of the preserve can be very good, but uh, I've always had very good luck there. Uh, Wendy Park and Whis on Whiskey Island. Uh, Wendy Park has, um, I think many of us have come to know about uh, the spring value of birding Wendy Park, but Wendy is also really great in the fall. It can be, there, there are days when it can be quiet, but um, with good weather fronts, Boy, that place can pick up warblers just like it does in spring. Maybe not the, the levels of concentration that we get in the spring, but because of the small space, where it's situated, the fact that you've got that wood lot that sits almost all alone, which is a few other places for birds to, to hang out, feed, hide, uh, rest, uh, that, those, that wood lot can be terrific in, uh, in fall as well. Uh, I go to Huntington Reservation. It's a little bit closer for me. I'm a West Sider. 
Uh, and I really love Huntington in the spring, but I also bird there occasionally in the fall. And I think many folks um, typically go right to the beach and work that ridge that's right in off the beach. Um, that can be really, really good first thing in the morning if birds arriving, if they've gone over the lake, and then birds moving along the lake for those that are moving typically from west to east. Um, but I also like the area uh, on the plateau <clears throat> just north of the Wolf Picnic area. If you walk out there um, through that plateau to uh, Porter Creek, you're going to be almost eye level with some of those um, big sycamore trees that are there. Uh, and it makes for some really uh, easy birding. You're not cranking your neck up trying to um, look directly above you. Uh, and you know, the birds move uh, just in off the lake some <clears throat> at, at some point, and, and on some days it can be really, really busy with, uh, with uh, migrants. Uh, Rocky River Reservation doesn't have the benefit of being on the lake like those other three. But as a West Sider, uh, it's, a, it's, it's local to me, and I find that the, uh, the paths there provide a lot of opportunity it can be quiet in between, but uh, like a lot of inland spots, you can bump into these mixed flock of birds, often accompanied by our woodland residents, you know, chickadees and titmice and so on, along with warblers and, and, other, and other songbirds. Um, I like Fort Hill, going up on Fort Hill um, early in the morning, trying to catch the birds that are moving maybe up onto Fort Hill or along the ridge, right along the, the river. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here are a few other area fall warbler spots that you might want to try, and um, hopefully Buster and Tim can expand on, on these spots because um, I don't bird them quite as frequently in fall. Uh, Sandy Ridge, which is, um, has been such a great birding location, uh, and is well known in spring. Um, probably doesn't get quite the same attention in fall, but it, it, it can be just as good in fall. Uh, it's got those nice uh, wet woodlands as you walk through those woods back to the impoundments. And um, I find that um, burning uh, along the loop trail against the uh, against that northern side of those woods can be productive on uh, warm, sunny mornings. Um, but I think there are um, other areas within the woods that are, are, are very good for warblers as well. And then uh, occasionally working the, um, the perimeter of that marsh loop trail um, up against the uh, areas where the developments are, the homes, you've got a sort of a narrow ridge of trees. Um, occasionally you can bump into a nice mixed flock that way as well. Um, Tim or Buster, I don't know if either of you has any additional information that you want to add now or if you intend to mention things later on. Later. Yeah, yeah I was just going to mention things later on as well, but we're all pretty much in the same loop with all these awesome spots. So uh, I was just going to, I was going to talk a little bit more about downtown, you know, including Erie Street and, um, and uh, obviously Huntington because I work there. And so, yeah. Okay. Well, let me just mention Headlands, then I'll leave uh, Erie Street for you, you guys to talk about. Um, but Headlands over in Lake County um, has, ha has been a traditional um, spot in migration for many, many years. And it deserves that strong reputation because the burning can be so good. I mean, again, it's a, it's a, it's a spot up against the lake. And so those migrants that are crossing find really good habitat there. You've got those dunes, which is really unique. Um, often that makes for a little easier birding sometimes when those birds come low into the shrubs and the grasses um, uh, right uh, along in the dunes. And then um, you've got really nice edge habitat to, to watch for, um, for warblers. So uh, headlands can be a, a really great spot in the fall. Um, another a uh, really nice feature of Headlands and quite frankly with Lakefront Nature Preserve and with Wendy is that those 
spots are birded so frequently that we can often get reports of what's being seen almost daily. So, um, you know, we can get a sense um, for what kinds of birds are being seen and when, and that gives those who live not too far away an opportunity to get there and join in the fun. So that's uh, all I wanted to cover now. There may be some opportunity for um, me to jump in on, on some of the things that Buster and Tim contribute, but guys, uh, Buster, I think take it away. Yeah, I don't know if there's a little problem with audio, but real quick, uh, I noticed, Tim Holborn, you mentioned a lot about the lakefront, so perhaps that is something that one of the other gentlemen or yourself could expound on, again, a little bit more perhaps later on, uh, you know, what's with the lake, what's with wetland areas like Sandy Ridge? Buster, are you, uh, we were having trouble hearing your audio, are you... Uh... Okay, well, I'll just, um, I'll jump in real quick while we're trying to resolve that and say, uh, and Tim, jump in too. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the fact that, uh, you know, during the fall migration, these birds are moving, obviously, from uh, north to south. Uh, they're, um, I know that we'll talk more about uh, the, the weather patterns that um, drive these birds south, um, but um, they tend to follow um, water courses or use them as um, navigational tools when they fly and they fly overnight. Um, some of these birds make the lake crossing. They, they fly directly over the lake. Many others fly around the lake, but they follow, they follow the Detroit River down or the, the western edge of Lake Erie and they come around and they follow the lake going from east to west or I'm sorry, west to east. Um, so they're using that as um, a, 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 a way of navigating um, on their way south. So um, because of that, either coming over the lake or working along the lake, they tend to funnel and concentrate uh, and stay along the lake looking for green spaces. And so the parks that Nancy, that you mentioned and, that, and some that I covered already, um, provide green spaces along the lake where these birds have concentrated. And in the mornings after their flight, they'll drop in and they'll, um, they'll often feed to try and refuel very quickly. And they'll, uh, and they'll use that, that area to feed and then rest for the day. They may stay a couple of days. They may, depending on weather, they may just drop in, refuel, and then leave the, the next night. Um, one thing that um, uh, I use, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Lights Out Cleveland and what we're doing with the birds uh, downtown, but one thing I use nightly is uh, um, a couple different apps to be able to predict when birds are moving. Um, this is really fun and really interesting and very, very nerdy, um, but maybe we could put these links in, in the chat um, but BirdCast is a very popular um, migration prediction for uh, they give the, the, the they give maps of three different days in a row of when birds are going to be predicted to be moving due to the weather um, conditions. Um, and so oftentimes I'll just go on BirdCast and see what we think you know what what it's going to be predicted wise for that night. Um, it'll have different colors on the map of intensity. So I think white is like extreme amount of birds coming through. Um, and then you have, I think, purple or, or blue is like really cold, dark, uh, no, bird, no birds are moving. And uh, it's really, really, really fun to use that. And it's, and it's dead on. Um, it, really is, uh, it, it really is a good app to use. Um, some things that we're still trying to figure out um, is – are the birds going to stop or are they going to keep going? Um, and so that's one thing that we're still trying to figure out uh, with Lights Out Cleveland, but um, it, it, the bird cast is dead on. Um, another thing we use is the, uh, uh, it's the, the radar map. Um, I think it's Tempest um, is, is uh, the name of it. I can look it up in a second, but um, it's another one with the, it's, it's a, a whole, it's a whole USA map of, uh, it's radar basically, but you know, so many birds get up in the air during migration that they pick up on the radar and you can actually see little blue, huge blue donuts um, that are actually birds moving. Um, another one I like to use is Windy TV. 
Um, I think it's called Windy TV. Maybe it's windy.com now. Um, but that shows wind, uh, you know, movement. So, uh, like Tim had said, in the fall, you know, the the, the uh, you want uh, northeast winds to bring the birds into Cleveland um, or just into Ohio in general. So the, those northeast winds are, you know, are going to be helping the birds. Are going to push the birds up in the air. Um, you know, it'll, it'll help them fly a little bit, work a little bit less. Um, so typically, when you have northeast winds in the fall, you should get a good amount of movement. But then in the um, in the spring, you want southwest. So that's kind of how what we're looking for. But those are a couple apps to use that can really help you predict what movement we're going to have for the next day. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Betsy put the BirdCast uh, link in the chat. So if you click on the little chat box at the bottom, you can see a nice map of the U.S. and the different color tones that are there indicating Again, the, the density, I guess that's the density of birds coming through, is that right? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So, you, you, uh, Tim Jasinski, you mentioned something about weather or uh, the winds. You said northeast winds, is that right? Yeah, so in the fall when we're looking for good songbird movement, um, northeast winds is what you're looking for because mm -hmm. they're they're going to kind of come down from the northeast, and that just seems anything from the north, really, but it seems to be northeast is what you're really looking for, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the fall, um, and, and that holds true with, with you know, when, we're, when we get a northeast wind, and that's when we find a lot of birds downtown and just a lot of birds in the migrant traps that we're going to talk about. Huh, interesting. Well, that's good. Good to know. Thank you. So well, yeah, I'm 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 very excited to join Buster and and Tim in this talk and and Nancy and Betsy. This is a really fun fun thing, and I appreciate uh, being offered to do this. This is super cool. Um, I love uh, warblers. Um, anyone that knows me knows I love uh, water birds. That's my number one thing. But I really do love warblers, and and I've always loved warblers. And uh, like Tim had said earlier, um, many people say you know it's um, I don't like the confusing fall warbler. Um, you know, wording. I don't like that at all because that kind of makes people think that they're confusing, and they're really not. There's a few that can kind of look similar, um, but they're not. They're not ha really hard if you really look at them. Uh, you know, they're not hard at all. Um, you know, a couple that that look similar in the fall right now are uh, bay breasted and black pole warblers. Um, you know, when they're put in the trees and you're trying to get your eyes on them. It's it's hard to uh, you know sometimes ID them, but especially with a camera, uh, that's a good way to snap some photos and, and double check later. But you know black pole and bay breasted look very different when they're when they're in the hand. Um, you know we see a lot of them with lights on Cleveland, um, but you know the black pole. The easiest way to tell black pole in the fall is they have yellow feet. Um, they'll be a little bit more of a yellowish tone to their throat and their and their face, um, where bay breasted will have uh, darker feet. Um, and it'll have, uh, they'll have kind of a chestnutty kind of wash to their flanks, to their sides underneath the wings. Um, you know, almost kind of see as, look, think it's a chestnut sided, but it's not that deep, but it, you certainly can see that in photos, um, that people have been posting. Um, so, you know, they're very similar, but they definitely, you definitely can tell them apart. Um, many of the other warblers are so different, you know, the pine are so different from, from the bay breasted and black pole, um, you know, because they have that, that real clean back. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I have some photos that we're going to put up later um, of some birds that we haven't, that we had in rehab. And uh, you can really see the, the differences in those. Uh, but it's, you really, when I'm out birding and, or teaching people about birding, or I'm trying to, you know, just out there having fun, it, you know, watching the behavior um, is one way to narrow down what species you're looking at. Um, if you see you know, the tail flicking up and down, you know, it's a couple different species. Uh, one very important one is the Kirtland's warbler, uh, which doesn't come through too often, but they do show up. And another more common one is the palm warbler, um, more specifically the western palm warbler. Um, we do see eastern palm warblers come through Ohio, but uh, they're, they're not as common because they are truly eastern. Um, but it, it's, it's about the behavior, you know. Um, some species are all the way at the top of the trees, like cerulean warblers, um, yellow-throated warblers, pine warblers. Those always tend to be towards the top of the trees. Um, 
and then you have some that are on the ground, like common yellow throats will be close to the ground or near the ground. Um, palm will be the same way. Um, Connecticut morning warblers are other the other two uh, bur you know warblers that people are always trying to seek out and find, um, and those are usually always on the ground or very close to the ground. So when I'm teaching people about birds, and if they're saying, "Ah, well, hey, I want to find a," You know, I want to find a moorland warbler, and I said, okay, well, you got to go to this specific habitat, and, and you got to look on the ground. And birding is, it takes patience. It, it's not easy. You're not just going to go to a spot, unlike Tim did the other day, where you just walk to a spot, get a parasitic gator, Jaeger, and leave in under 30 seconds. You know, most of the time, birding's not like that. It's you, you have to put put patience into it. You got to really take your time, and you know. A lot of times I'll just stand there and watch one area for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, um, and then you really see the woods start to come alive. And I do this a lot in Huntington Reservation. I know that uh, Tim had mentioned it a little bit be before, but Huntington Reservation is awesome. Cleveland Metro Parks have such a great place for birding uh, and just other nature activities. But um, Huntington is great because it's right on the lakefront, like Nancy had said. Um, and Tim had said, and, and that's just a great place for birds to stop and refuel before the migration north or south. Um, I find the whole park to be great for warblers. Um, the best two spots, I would say, are right behind the nature center um, along the bunny trail, they call it, even though I've never seen a bunny there ever in my life. It's called the bunny trail. Um, and in those, those hemlocks there, it's always loaded with black-footed blue, black-footed green. Um, you can hear yellow. Um, you can hear Louisiana uh, water thrush singing in the spring. Um, <clears throat> but it'll have all tons, a ton types of warblers back there. Um, and you know, sometimes you can get, you know, 15, 16, 18 different species in a day um, if you get the right weather. Um, and it's just that top of the ridge is great. Just walk behind the bunny trail there. You can look over um, by the fence by the turkey exhibit. You can look down into the valley there, and there's a lot of uh, um, foliage um, and plants and blackberry bushes right down underneath you, and that's really good for morning warblers, Connecticut warblers, um, common yellow throats. Um, that's a really, really good spot there. Uh, my other favorite spot to um, to check is um, if you follow if you're if you're at the nature center and you walk down uh, towards the lake, you kind of dip down underneath the old train trestle there, and there's the field on the right hand side. Um, that field is great uh, for, for warblers, and, and if you're facing east, the left side of the field, there, there's a lot of brush there, and that's great for all kinds of warblers. It just, it's, it's, it's a fantastic spot. And then um, along the creek there, if you just follow the creek and walk that all the way to, to the edge where it kind of bends around and goes under the road, just before that on the left-hand side, the edge of that field is fantastic. That's that is my Kentucky warbler spot, I tell people. Um, last year, I think it was in spring of 19, I told myself, I still want to find a Kentucky warbler, you know, just because I wanted to go look, and I didn't think I would find one. Um, but we, I found a, a Kentucky warbler over there, um, and I got the word out, and Jen Brumfield came out, and a bunch of people did, and everyone got great photos of that bird because it was right there in front of you, um, and it was feeding and happily doing what warblers do. And it's, it's, I never thought that I'd find one, but sure enough, we, we did. Um, and we even got one from Lights Out that spring, too. So um, that's another great spot there. Um, another new spot that's, that's just going to be – it's going to be great for common yellow throats, and I think it's going to be great for um, orange crown warblers is that new pollinator habitat that the Cleveland Metro Parks just installed. This will be the third s summer, I think, now that it's been growing. Um, and there's a lot of great plants in there. They plant, planted all the native plants there, and it's a fantastic area. Um, I've seen a lot of good birds in there, and I really haven't even explored it much. So that's another good spot. So Huntington Reservation is just incredible for uh, for these these birds. Um, you know, not just warblers. I mean, tons of things. Uh, you know, uh, we, you can can be seen in there. Um, you know, we release most of our lights out birds there. A ton of a ton of woodcock get released there, um, and all of our other songbirds. But it's 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 great for for everything. So um, I just I just love Huntington. Um, just obviously not because I just work there, but it's it's a great place. Um, another place that I love to bird, and most people don't know about, it, is just downtown Cleveland. Um, Erie Street Cemetery is very very popular um, for birders. Um, you know everyone knows about that place. You know Chuck. Cesar Chick's always 
post some amazing photos down, from down there. Um, Carl Bachtel will do a lot of, you know, Channel 3 news stories about birding down there. But that's not the only migrant trap down there. Um, from us monitoring in downtown Cleveland with Lights Out Cleveland, um, Public Square is a fantastic spot. It's a can be a death trap, unfortunately, but it's got a lot of habitat. So, you know, I've, I've heard black of green down there singing magnolias, um, bay-breasted black pole, um, black and whites. Um, ch- we even had a uh, yellow-breasted chat down there. Um, it's a great place. Um, Public Square is a great place to look for birds. You wouldn't think it would be, but it's a fan- it's fantastic. Um, I uh, scored David Lindo his life for American Woodcock in that very field in Public Square last spring. It was it was fantastic. Um, but also another spot is um, it's on the corner of East Ninth and Lakeside. The federal uh, the federal office building is right there. The Anthony Celebrezzi building. That's great, too. There's a bunch of habitat right on the uh, west side of that building. And there's a, I, I've had every thrush that comes through Ohio in those, in those trees at one time uh, a few springs ago. Um, and all the warblers, tons of oven birds are walking around down there. Common yellow, yellow throats, Nashville, uh, black and white, palm. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic spot. Um, so if you're, you're looking for warblers and, you know, especially with COVID going on, I haven't really been out birding just cause I want to be safe with this. Um, but that, those are spots that most people don't know about or don't go to, um, not to get the warblers out of there, but, um, it's also great for sparrows. Um, I guarantee a ton of rare sparrows show up in downtown Cleveland every fall, uh, and spring, but more so in fall, um, in between the, the Hilton and, um, whatever big, uh, I think it's a Cleveland Convention Center. Yeah, the old um, there's a bunch of yeah. yeah, 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 right there. So there's this a bunch of um, like mirrored um, statues or wherever it is in in a bunch of grasses, and it is fantastic for sparrows. I mean, I've I've seen hundreds of sparrows at one time in those bushes. So I've seen orange crowned orange crowned warblers in there. So that's a fantastic spot to look. Um, Downtown Cleveland is just amazing. It's not just Erie Street Cemetery. That Perk Plaza is also really good. It's just a little section of trees, and that's all the birds need to, to, to stop and find their migration. I mean, you know, when people think warblers, they think McGee Marsh, and, and ab- absolute, absolutely that's a great place. But Cleveland Metro Parks and other places holds just as, just as many warblers, um, you know, and, and just as, as good looks um, as, as McGee Marsh does, and it's less crowded usually. Um, so, you know, the, the, the downtown Cleveland is, is amazing. And, you know, obviously, you know, Wendy Park, uh, Tim talked about that, and that's just a, you know, that's an, an amazing spot there. Um, and it's just a little migrant trap that the birds use, you know, for their, their stopover points. And, and, you know, downtown Cleveland is just a little bit east of that, um, and although it's a very dangerous spot for birds, a lot of them do do stop there and make it out um, on you know to continue their migration. So it really is an amazing spot. So I, I just love all those areas, and those are my two favorite places to, to bird for, especially for warblers. Is is that another place I know Nancy is a uh, a big on is Lake Isaac. Um, that's in in Middleburg Heights. Uh, that's that's in you know Cleveland Metro Parks as well. No no surprise. That's another great spot for warblers. I had my, um, I think my life or hooded warbler there. Um, it was my first bird there. Um, that's just another great spot. So when you get to the marsh, you park, you kind of walk right um, down the trail, and it'll kind of bend down around um, across a little bridge that they just made, and then it goes to a field, and um, right there, past that field into the woods is great for warblers. I mean, I've seen so many cool species in there. Um, and it's it's a fantastic spot to go. So um, Lake Isaac is just fantastic. Um, I don't know if Tim, you have any other comments. Is Buster back online at all? Not hearing him. I, I'll just mention that um, I worked downtown for probably 22, 23 years. Um, in the you know when I first moved to Cleveland, I recognized the potential of downtown right away. Um, with the old Donald Gray Gardens behind the old football stadium, which was a tremendous migrant trap then. And um, that led me to start exploring in the city a a lot more. And um, I birded the old, I worked in Key Tower, so I birded the public square frequently. And so I'll reiterate what Tim said, that in migration, um, the city can hold a lot of birds you know, if uh, if those birds are moving and a weather system comes in, 
um, they'll get trapped in the city and they'll look for small green spaces, as Tim pointed out. They don't need a lot. If they can find a, a small patch of trees, um, they'll work those trees and they could be there for hours before moving around. They'll, they'll, they'll get, cons what seems to me, they'll, they'll be a little concerned about um, moving from uh, some habitat. Um, they may have to cross over some space to get to some, some new habitat. So they, they'll stick around for hours um, in, in a little patch of woodlands and you can see them circling around. I've been to several of the places that Tim talked about and I, uh, I, I support everything you said about, about checking those spots. And I mentioned uh, in my notes about Erie is that, you know, for a lot of us, we're birding several locations, maybe both east and west of downtown. So we've got to go right through or right around downtown on our way to, you know, one spot or another. It, it can be really valuable to stop into a place like Geary Street Cemetery or work a couple of those small spots, especially on a weekend when downtown's quieter. Work in a couple of those spots. Um, you can, you know, find pretty quick access to those locations. You can, because they're so small, you can work them for as long as you'd like, and then you can move on. And so um, I think there's a, a real benefit to trying to find some of those birds, uh, especially on those days when, when the weather might have changed overnight and some of those birds are really trapped there. Tim, you'd know more about the weather conditions that kind of bring those birds into the city and, and you know, increase the numbers. But yeah, I really like downtown Cleveland as well. And um, I'm retired now, but I, 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 miss, um, I miss birding downtown. I had uh, Virginia Rail in the, uh, in the old uh, public square. And oh, yeah. uh, I think a bunch of us remember a couple of uh, years ago, last year, the year before, Chuck Will's widow being found downtown. And so, you, you know, people should be aware that not only do we get these migrants, but we get rarities, um, birds that you wouldn't expect downtown. And Tim and his bird lights, our lights out team, um, you know, can, can vouch that um, unusual species do show up. They do, uh, and and actually last year was uh, last fall uh, we rescued a yellow rail down there, and so that was uh, that was a a pretty impressive bird, and it was released luckily, um, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't severely harmed uh, or injured. Um, you know, when my volunteer sent the picture of that to me, I'm like, oh, oh my god, I, I knew it, I knew we'd get one eventually. Um, I've seen more Connecticut warblers in downtown Cleveland than I've ever seen anywhere. Um, I've seen a few a day down there. Um, so if you really want to get a Connecticut warbler, you got to go downtown. I mean, I know Wendy Park is great and, and other places, but the, the thing about downtown is the, is the little migrant traps are smaller. So it's still great for the birds, um, but it, it's smaller. So it's easier to kind of wait around and wait for that Connecticut to come walking underneath uh, the bushes out in the open. I know right in front of... Uh, uh, on the east side of the Hilton, um, there's there's some grasses there, and uh, we had a Connecticut warbler walking around in there. And, and the difference between Connecticut and Morning, um, you know, many people think they look identical, and they can look pretty similar, but that behavior is what you're looking for. Connecticut's walk. Um, they walk like oven birds, so, so they're not going to be hopping around like a yellow throat or a Morning. They're going to be walking. So that's one easy way to know if you saw Connecticut – as if it was walking. That's, I mean, they can't say they don't hop, but certainly the majority of the time they're walking. Um, and I've seen more of those down there than anywhere. Um, it is really a great place uh, down there. And, you know, it, we do have Lights Out Cleveland, you know, is a, uh, is a volunteer effort that, that's run through Lake Erie Nature and Science Center and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and Akron Zoo through the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. Um, and uh, the, the goal is to reduce uh, exterior lighting and extra lighting in downtown Cleveland to, to help those migrants continue their migration. Um, like Tim said begin, in the beginning, most songbirds are migratory at night. So um, before humans got here and, and made these amazing lights and windows and glass, um, and amazing, I'm being sarcastic about the amazing part of that, um, but, uh, you know, they, they, they've done this for millennia, um, you know, migrating birds. And um, these lights disorient the birds. It, it confuses them. Um, and uh, for some reason, they're attracted to the white lights. So just like moths at your light on the porch light, it's the same thing. Um, I have videos of, of hundreds of songbirds 
mostly warblers circle in buildings in, in the exterior lighting of, of the buildings. And uh, Tim, you had asked before I started talking uh, here um, if there's anything weather prediction, and, and absolutely. The one thing that, that really will drop birds and make up what's called a fallout is a storm front. So um, you, you could have nice, good northeast winds coming out in the fall, um, and then uh, a storm front can move through, and it'll drop all those birds because they're not going to fly in the, in the rain like that. So it makes them fall out of the sky, basically. It's called a fallout, and they come down and try to find habitat. Um, and the worst days that we've had in downtown Cleveland uh, with, with rescuing birds um, is when it's really, really foggy. Um, the birds are going to fly lower, and then they're going to be in trouble. Um, so uh, if you have a foggy morning, you know, where you had good, good conditions the night before, uh, that's, um, that will bring a lot of birds down um, to these migrant traps. So that's, that's one thing to look for. Um, you know, if you have a storm front, especially south of us, um, that way the birds know it's there and they just kind of come down. So um, that's, that's one thing to do is to, to look for that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah, I know you, both of you have really expounded a lot on the lakefront, downtown, um, but you know some of our visitors may not be, uh, and, and guests that are on here may not be as familiar with the Cleveland area, um, but they may be familiar with areas. So, you know, think for those who may not be around the Cleveland area, use the pocket parks around your town or your city. Think about the weather conditions. So everything that these gentlemen are, are mentioning for here in Cleveland can work pretty much as well in a lot of the areas where you may be living too. Um, again, diversity of habitat, low brush, uh, taller trees, uh, little waterways, uh, stream courses, so, uh, and then patience. I love that patience too. Yeah, so sometimes it does take a while. Uh, if you walk up and the birds fly away, and then you stand a little while and they'll come back. They'll be all around. Um, and Tim Jasinski mentioned one thing too with the, with COVID. Um, this is a time when you might want to go out with maybe one or two friends. Certainly, uh, take all the COVID precautions. Try to not have it large groups. You know, uh, wear your face mask. Uh, try to stay at least six feet apart. I know that's really hard when you're birding and you want to show somebody, oh, come on, what's right over there? You, know, you just want to grab their shoulders and move them to the right spot, but. Uh, but yeah, it can be done. Um, so I, I, again, I hope some of our visitors that are on uh, the, the program this evening, um, if you do have questions, you maybe you're from, an, uh, again, from out of town, another state. We've had people join in from other states. Um, maybe we can help uh, identify some areas around the Cleveland area. Maybe you're from Lake County or Medina County or, or Lorain County, which a couple, couple places were mentioned. Do we have Buster yet, or do, do I still want to chat a little bit? Um, Tim Jasinski, did you say that you had some some uh, slides? Yeah, so um, Betsy actually just texted me, so I was going through to try to figure out how to not delete the the the, the, um, the video here and check my text messages. Okay. Um, yeah, she, uh, Betsy's going to put some photos up. Um, that I um, that I sent her, um, and I could talk a little bit about each of the photos. Some of the birds um, may be deceased in the photo, um, but it actually can really show you detail on uh, you know on each bird. Um, and they're not graphic or anything. I mean, they are deceased, but it, it does you know what we what all what we know about birds um, with their their sizes and shapes and sex and mold pattern. That's all from museum specimens. Uh, and those are all dead birds, unfortunately. So we can learn a lot about these birds, um, even if they're unfortunately killed by windows or cats or other things. So um, this bird right here is a bird that um, actually um, uh, Tim Colburn had put a photo up early on. This is a pine warbler. Um, so the one that Tim had put up is was real drab, um, real real drab. It's probably a first first year female. Um, this one, um, I forget what sex this bird was, but. This is a palm, a, 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 a pine warbler. Um, you know, it, no other warbler looks like that. Um, they have a real clean green back. And I think there's another photo, Betsy, of the same bird um, from the side view. Um, 
and it, you, you can see that, that yeah, there you go, uh, that back pattern, um, there's no striping or spotting or, or anything on that. that that's very clean. Um, you know, initially, I, I never saw a uh, pine warbler in the hand uh, before Lights Out Cleveland. So, you know, when I was expecting to see a pine warbler, I, I thought it was going to be very similar to black hole or bay-breasted. But when we got our first pine warbler, I'm like, oh, man, that's totally different, um, totally different pattern on the back. Um, it, it just they, they look so differently. So I wanna I wish people would get get uh, you know away from that stigma of confusing fall warbler because they're they're not confusing if you pay attention um, and if you just even look at a little bit of detail. Um, we can go to the next slide, Bet, uh, Betsy. So this bird um, is is a uh, is like a Tim had mentioned early on. Uh, it's a yellow warbler. This bird these birds are already kind of on the move out of here. A lot of the males uh, start migrating in July. Um, so this is a yellow warbler that we that we rescued in downtown Cleveland. Um, we don't get many, and I think one of the reasons why that is is because they migrate early, and so most of the monitoring efforts uh, start August 15th. I think a lot of these guys are already on their way out by then. Um, so this is a yellow warbler. It's, it's probably a young female. I don't remember the sex of this bird, but you can see that yellow in the tail. Um, I don't believe any other warbler is going to have that um, with that you know kind of greenish olive on the on the sides and the yellow towards the middle of the tail feather. Um, I don't think any other bird has that, so um, that's an easy field mark. And you know, the, the olive green. I mean, most of the warblers are olive green, but this one is. You know, you can really see. Um, you know, that it doesn't have wing bars really. Um, it doesn't have any other any other color but yellowish green, and and that's a yellow warbler. So those are uh, very common during during breeding season. Um, you know, but they're not real common during during um, migration. I think that's because we start looking for them uh, too too late. Um, they're already out of here. Could you go to the next photo? So this photo is a sad photo. Um, this is a, a Connecticut warbler and a morning warbler. So they look very, very similar. Um, Connecticut warbler is, is the one on the top. They're a little bit bigger than morning warblers. Um, they, like, they do look very similar, though. One difference, though, is, is on the face. Um, and I don't know if we have, did I send you that close-up picture of the face, uh, Betsy? I think I did. Um, when you look at the face, there you go, um, the Connecticut warbler doesn't really have yellow on the face. That's the bird on top there. It has a full eye ring, um, and the, the morning underneath has a partial eye ring, and has a little bit of yellow on the lores there, the, the spot right, right uh, in front of the eye towards the bill. Um, that's called the lore, and there's a little yellowish buffy color in there, where on the Connecticut, it's very, very gray. Um, you know, there can be a little bit of yellow in there, but for the most part, it, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty gray overall. Um, and you can see on the chest of the morning warbler, um, there's a little dark spot there. I'm not sure what sex that bird was, but, um, you know, that's, they look very similar, but, um, you know, they look very, very different when you really pay attention and really look. I know sometimes with warblers, you have a second to look and they're gone, um, but, you know that that's a, really an easy easy um, idea in my opinion. Um, you know, with those, um, what's the next slide, Betsy? So this is a a, a bird. I, I wanted to see if we can have a a, um, a quiz on this bird. Um, if anyone in the chat wants to throw up a question or an answer, what what species do you think this is? We'll give it a a, a little bit of a, um, a a few minutes or a few seconds for people to to to. Uh, throw their comments in, um, but you can see it's got a partial eye ring. It's kind of buffyish yellow. Um, it's got some yellow on the throat. Um, it's got the, the green on the, on the cap there. Um, you can see a little bit on the, in the photo. There's some yellow on the stomach uh, and the flanks on the side there. Um, do we have anybody trying to comment at all on that? Oh, I, don't see any, I don't see anything coming in. <laughs> Get your bird. Should I just give the folks. answer? <laughs> we'll give it another. See if anyone wants to be brave and try to ID this bird. Um, I'll give you a hint. I did show a photo of this bird previously. Um, not not the specific bird. Um, close. It's it's a good quite good good guess on pine. Um, it's not a pine, um, and it's not a yellow throat. Yellow throats won't have that eye ring. It's a, it's a skulker, so it's a bird that, that likes to hang out low, like I would mentioned before. Um, and if you remember and you were listening to our 
the comments um, or the the uh, the um, descriptions, this bird hops along the ground. No other guesses. No, it's not a palm. Uh, palm would be um, wouldn't have the eye ring, and they would they would be have more yellow on the on the face. Um, this is a morning warbler, so you can see it's got a little bit of yellow on the lores there, um, underneath on the on the throat, um, and and a partial eye ring. Uh, that's that's classic for morning warbler. Um, so that was good guessing. You guys had some uh, birds that definitely look similar. So those are three birds I would say would look similar. So uh, good guessing. That was awesome. What else have we got on this slide, Betsy? I forget what else what I texted you. <clears throat> so this is, uh, even though we're in a warbler talk, um, they used to be warblers, so I, I figured I would still throw this guy in there. This is a yellow-breasted chat. Um, we've, oh, where did it go? There we go. So um, chat are not warblers anymore. They just put it in their own. I think it was last year. Tim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we, uh, ornithologists, threw that into its own um its own uh, order, um, not order, its own um, species <clears throat> and uh, subspecies, um, and it's similar to blackbirds. So that kind of confuses everybody. It's got an extra eye in there, uh, <laughs> but they're not warblers anymore. So I still love them. They're still a cool bird, and and I, we've seen a couple of those downtown. Um, next photo I uh, I saw Betsy threw up was of northern and um, Louisiana water thrush. So these are two birds that that many people often mistake for thrushes. Um, you know, with those spots in the belly, but um, these are warblers, and uh, the northern water thrush um, migrates through, I believe, earlier than the Louisiana, um, and uh, the uh, the top bird is the Louisiana. They're going to be more white. They're not going to be as as buffy yellow as the the Louisi or the, the northerns are. Um, you can see that supercilium, that stripe that goes along the eye. Um, on both birds, it does have some buffy color, but on the on the northern on the bottom, it really has a lot of yellow on there, um, and that's how you differenti differentiate the two species. If you have a water thrush walking along a creek, um, uh, and you see some some white or mostly white, you're you're looking at a Louisiana. Um, so this is a really good a good way to to look at them up close and and see the difference in those birds. It's it's much easier when you see them together. You're like, oh, that's that's obvious. But when you're in the field, it's not always that obvious. So that's why I'm always talking about looking at specific field marks or behaviors on the birds. Um, so that's 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 how I ID those guys. Did I give you any more photos, Betsy? I thought I sent more, but I don't remember. <laughs> uh, that was it, Tim. That was it. Okay. Um, yeah. So if any anyone has any questions for any of the photos or anything that I've said, feel free to shoot it in the chat. Um, is Buster on at all? Did we get him in? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we can do, Tim, um, in Buster's absence here, I know one of the things that Buster was going to talk about was uh, resources to try and uh, learn where you can find some of these birds more directly. And we, you know, we talked about some of the spots we like to bird and um, how to bird those spots a little bit. But um, one of the resources that probably you and I and Buster and probably most of us on this call use is eBird. And there is a lot of terrific information that you can find on eBird. And certainly, you know, the Internet is a, a powerhouse of research um, for those of us that want to learn more about uh, warblers and any birds. Um, but eBird gives us very current information about where birds are being seen uh, near us recently. Uh, and so uh, I would encourage all of us to... Uh, you know, take a look at the Explore feature on eBird and use the locations um, that you're interested in. And by doing that, you can then sort of search um, their, um, their uh, abundance charts to see, uh, you know, uh, what volume is moving, is, is, is more likely reported at, at different times. Um, in fact, it, uh, one of the one of the it was one of the tools I used um, in preparing uh, for this presentation is looking at Cuyahoga County's um, abundance charts, their illustrated checklist they call it, and you can see um, through a, 
um, a, a chart of the um, of the calendar year, the relative uh, abundance of these birds uh, based on eBird reports of their sightings. So that's a great way to check, and get a sense of what birds you can expect. And um, there's also a feature within Explore um, to look at recent checklists. So you can kind of scan recent checklists that are of, uh, of locations of hotspots, of eBird hotspots, to see what birds were seen as recently as, say, earlier that same day or within a few hours. There's a little bit of lag time in those reports, but not much. So let's say you, uh, you've been birding and uh, you stop for a moment and you're, you're ready to move to a different area. Let's say you've been birding the lakefront, but as Nancy suggests, maybe you're looking to the interior and you're thinking about driving down to Cuyahoga Valley Na uh, National Park. Well, you could pull up the National Park, um, one of the various locations. Let's say you want to go to the Station Road area. You could pull up that hotspot through Explore and look to see if there were any checklists from that morning. And you could check to see what was seen, and you would then at least have an idea of what some of those possible species would be. And that's just one way to use uh, the tool to try and find certain birds. And, you know, in migration, you're likely going to find more reports and you're going to find um, you're going to find more frequent reports. Um, Tim, I don't know if you want to add anything about using eBird. Um, well, you pretty much covered that. Um, I, eBird is a fantastic tool, um, and not only is it is it easy to to, to navigate and, and and it's fun to use, but it's it's a scientific um, you know data point. So uh, it's a great way to um, help science understand where the birds are, are, what time of year. And that's how we learn this kind of stuff is from citizen science projects like eBird. Um, eBird's a fantastic uh, program. Um, one other thing that I like to use for, for birds is social media. Um, a Facebook is a, is a great way to, to find out what birds are showing up. You know, you're friends with, most of us are friends with a bunch of birders and, you know, half of the birds, people on my friends list are birders and, you know, they'll be posting photos. Um, Ohio Chase Birds is a good uh, Facebook group to look for. Um, that will um, show what rare species are showing up, um, uh, you know, in, in the area in Ohio. Um, um, and uh, it, it's just a great place. Ohio Backyard Birding is another one that's great. Um, uh, birding in Ohio, those, all those are, are great to, to look what birds are being seen. And so if there's migration happening, people are taking photos and they're throwing them online. So uh, Birding Ohio is a great place to start uh, to look for, um, you know, like-minded people and where people are finding things. Um, and so, you know, and it's a great place to reach out and meet people. Um, I've met most of my birding friends from the, the Facebook forums and then being out in the field. So if you're, you know, you really want to see a pine warbler and, you, you know, you're, you're, you're hell, hell bent on seeing one, you can throw up a comment on there and say, hey, I really want to see a pine warbler. Has any, you know, been seen recently? Um, and, you know, use that as well, not only just eBird, uh, but, but that too, and that might get a, you know, a, a quicker, easier response. Um, but, you know, like Tim said, uh, eBird's great to use. Um, so that's another way to do it is, is social media. Um, that's a great place, a great way to, to figure out what birds are coming through um, and, uh, you know, what's happening. And um, in addition to the three that you mentioned, you know, Ohio backyard birds, um, chase birds, Ohio chase birds, which is really rarities, almost exclusively rarities, the, the birds that are rare. And um, in addition, those birds, as the title suggests, are birds that um, have a possibility of sticking around and being in a public location with access. So that makes them chaseable, if you will. Ohio birds is the kind of general um, site for state birding statewide, but there are a lot of Northeast Ohio users of that, uh, members of that group. But then there are also county groups like uh, the Lorraine County Birders Group and the Trumbull County Birders Group. So, um, you know, it's really amazing how many local birding Facebook groups there are. And I agree with Tim that um, 
it is not only a resource for information, but it's a resource for connections. And generally, I find that people are more than happy to try and help each other find birds. Um, many of you are familiar with the big year concept. For those birders who are trying to complete a 300-year in Ohio, for example, um, you often see information traded about you know, where to look for um, some species that are tougher to find or that birders somehow missed during their the early half of their, their first half, or early part of their big year. Um, so there's a lot of sharing that's always going on there. And I would um, agree with Tim and encourage you to, to use that as a way to um, not only help yourself find birds and learn, but to meet other birders who share the same passion you do. Exactly. And one thing I want to add to this is that, um, you know, some new birders uh, may have never seen a black and white warbler before or uh, a bay breasted or a yellow warbler. And um, I've often encountered new birders in the field and, you know, I'm looking for a rarity or something. And they're like, oh, have you seen a, I've never seen a, a yellow warbler before. I've never seen this. And uh, there was one guy and I forget his name now, but I was at Sandy Ridge Reservation one year birding and, and I ran into him and his wife there and, uh, they said they're new to birding and, and they wanted to see as many birds as they can. And I said, okay, well, what haven't you seen? And he said, well, I've, I haven't seen most of them. I'm like, okay, well, let's walk and I'll show you what we see. And, and I think I scored him 32 lifers that day or something. Uh, so we, we want to remember that when we're out birding, um, you know, you may know much more than other people, um, you know, and there's a lot of people that know more than you and there's a lot that know more less than you. So always, I'm always patient with people and try to help them because you never know what you can do to, to, to spark a person's interest or, or pique their interest in this, this hobby of ours. Um, so even though, you know, um, you know, common yellow throats are common and they're everywhere, they may be a light bird for somebody and someone, you know, even from maybe from the West coast wants to come out and see a blue jay. Um, you know, that's a bird that we see every day and we all, you know, sometimes forget about, but, you know, we all got to remember that, you know, this this is a, a great way to share things with people and share the love of birds. And, and always, um, I always encourage helping people out um, score that life or even if it's a pine warbler, you know. These are all great points, fantastic points. First of all, uh, the friendliness of birders, the willingness to share what you've seen and your excitement. Uh, also, the, the eBird, the hotspots, the easiness, the easy way to access um, different places. So, um, yeah, this is this is fantastic. I really appreciate you guys. I don't know, Buster. I think he's going to try to call in. Ah, oh, there was some good stuff that I just saw on a slide. Yeah. I don't know, Betsy. Can you pull up that one slide that I just that I just saw that had like three links on it? I know Betsy's really trying to help. Yeah. So so again, uh, as as uh, Tim Jasinski, oh, there we are. Tools to find migrating fall warblers. These are things. Again, the Buster will be talking about the first one. I believe uh, Tim Jasinski had mentioned. Um, but take a look at those. You may want to take. Oh, and eBird is on there as well too. This is fantastic. All good stuff. Tim Jasinski mentioned uh, Lake Isaac. I, I since I live nearby, it's real easy for me to just walk over there whenever I want to. I'm retired too, so. So I now have a little bit more time to do some birding early in the morning. And uh, I've, I've, there are just some surprises, you know. I'm there for warblers, but, you know, an osprey is circling. Or uh, a Caspian tern comes by. Or, uh, my goodness, I'm trying to think, oh, a white-eyed vireo was hanging around for a couple days. I didn't see it recently, but, you know, people are asking about that. I, I posted on eBird. So people are coming and asking. I've run into a couple of folks saying, oh, uh, I heard that there's a white-eyed vireo. It would be a lifer for me. So, you know, so this is the kind of stuff, this is word gets around. So we hope that if you are birding, uh, again, share either 
one-on-one -on -one with somebody. Uh, share your information on eBird, always good. And do we have a live buster yet? No, we don't. Not yet. Uh, I don't know if either of the gentlemen, uh, again, want to mention e any of the, again, the three that are listed there on the slide. Uh, again, the bird migration map mentioned earlier. Uh, Google Earth. Any of you Google Earth much? I don't use Google Earth for, for birding. Um, it, I definitely understand why. I, I know why that could be good, um, you know, to be looking and see habitat. But um, the, the main ones that I really use are, are BirdCast um, and that. Um, Tell me one to go. Okay, try it now. Ah. Hello? Hey. Hi. Hey. A Maybe I know that they hear me. Like yeah, we can hear you. Somebody. We can, but it's kind of not very loud. Betsy and I have rigged it up on her speakerphone and I'm talking. So you're looking at my screen and a lot of this has already gone over. Bird migration map, huge, gives you a good forecast. Is tomorrow a great day? Is it a terrible day? All those things. Below it, there's something that, that we just never thought about. Let's just go to Google Earth and look at Cleveland and look for something green in an area that's not green. Just look for a pocket because... You know, my wife and I have walked metro parks all over the place that are beautiful, beautiful habitat. But if there's beautiful habitat for a 10-mile circle around there, it's not necessarily going to be a good trap. It's like finding an oasis in the desert. All the animals flock to the oasis. The small green spots in an area that's not green. We already talked about eBird. Just remember, when you go to eBird, you can explore species. You can explore the region, the county, the state. And when you're in the county, click on the thing called hotspots. <coughs> click on the hotspots. It'll give you at least a place where most people are logging in, and then you can explore by species. Again, if you have a bird you want to see, or if you just want to look in your park, what I usually do is do last 10 years, and I look at a park uh, for first, September, and I'll get an idea of what's being seen. If we go to the next slide, Vets. Okay, how about this? Just a Google search. Go to Conneaut, Ohio birding. Just, just click that in the Google search, and you can get all kind of information, including Audubon sites and information. If I'm going out of town or going to a place I don't know, I'll click and I'll look for a local Audubon site, and I'll send a message to the person. Hey, I'm going to be in this town for this day. Do you have suggestions for it? So don't forget something just as simple as Google. Okay, next. Okay, here's my favorite areas in and around Cleveland. So in Lake County, Headlands Beach State Park, and um, Headland Beach State Dunes, Mentor Lagoons is also another fabulous place to look again. It's another one right up against the lake. Mentor Marsh, I, like, I know it's not warbler, but um, if you want to go see some some uh, sparrows that are going to be coming in, um, Wake Robin Trail is going to be really, really good very shortly. Chagrin River Park is, is in Willoughby. It is a fabulous place. If you want to go out farther, Lake Erie Bluffs is uh, just north of the Perry Nuclear Power Plant. Nesting Chats. So there's lots of great places to see along there. Next slide, please. In Geauga County, now Ladue is more of a, a do-everything thing, but if we go um, to Boring Meadows, uh, there are some warblers in the area. I highly recommend Elgin Russell Park if you want to see nesting prothonotary warblers. Dan Best, who was a, a, a naturalist at Geauga County Metro Parks, actually has created a ton of nesting sites. He takes old bottles from Metamucil, sprays them like camouflage and sticks them off over the Cuyahoga River, and he has tremendous success. You want to see nesting prothonotaries. You want to see a uh, blue wing nesting. You want to see hooded warblers nesting. Held in Russell Park last year, we had a beautiful prairie warbler. And then this, this spring, with COVID not letting people go, there is this tiny little park that has basketball courts and soccer fields and sand volleyball courts called West Geauga Commons. It is a city park 
but there is a wooded area that goes along the river there. We had morning warbler there for three days. We had prairie warbler there. I think there were 14 species of warbler seen in a week there during migration. And I think we can thank COVID because people, instead of heading to McGee, stuck around home, did local paths. And next thing you know, something like one of in Java County, they had a Kirtland warbler at Headwaters Park. So, I mean, you just kind of go out and go, but there are some fabulous places. So that's Geauga County. Next. I put Ashtabula. By the way, Ashtabula for warblers, not so much. You want to see bald eagles? We saw 77 at one time in one day last fall, in one day at one time. We set up three scopes, pointed them in different directions, and said, look. And it's also the shorebird capital of this area. It's ridiculous. Red knot was seen on Sunday. Always get habitat, curlews. Any type of shorebird you can get fabulous. People probably already mentioned Lorraine. The Lorraine Impound is a fabulous place for all kinds of birds. And in Lorraine Metro Parks, I listed Sandy Ridge, which everybody else has talked about. Love it. And it's also great because you have a great resource there because Tim Fairweather. He just said, Tim, what have you been seeing? And he'll be happy to tell you where to go. Carlisle Reservation, Bev Walburn works there. She does an excellent job. Great burner. You can see some fabulous things there. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, I also include Wellington. Market Peak is only a couple years old, and, and it's going to be a fabulous place. I mean, nesting dick thistles. They also had Navaset there in the back for a couple weeks. Again, these are fabulous places, but they're green areas, again, in the middle of, of, of buildings and suburbs and all that, so it's a great spot. All right, next. If you're going to go west, Ottawa, McGee Marsh, obviously. Um, I would also include with Ottawa, uh, the Ottawa National Wildlife uh, Reserve. And um, a little bit farther, I would also include, I, and I meant to put it there in Lucas County, Howard Marsh is going to be a major birding spot for the next couple of years, considering it's brand new and all the things that are happening there. I mean, it's fabulous. When you have nesting yellow-headed blackbirds in Ohio, it's a great spot to see. So keep your eye out on that. And in Erie County, if you go to Sheldon Marsh or Big Creek, again, these are birding incredible hotspots. And again, just click on one of these places and go into eBird, look in the county. It'll hit if you hit hotspots, it'll hit these things. And then go to the month you're in right now and just check the last 10 years and see what's going on. But there's a lot of stuff to see. Next slide, please, Beth. South, Ashland County. If you want to see warblers when you can't see them anywhere else, go to Mohican. Mohican State Park has the fabulous. Um, I took the bird nerds there. We met uh, Chris from Rogue Birders, and we killed it. We had yellow throated <laughs> warbler right on the right on the bridge. There was a, a northern pool was sitting the second we got out of a car. There was a nesting winter wren. Hooded warbler flew down and almost landed on our hat. I think we had a 14 warbler species, species day, and sadly we did not get worm eating. And that is a place you can normally get something special, like a warbling, I mean a worm eating um, warbler, which is special in Ohio. And then I put down here, there's the new phone number for the Baba Link area hotline. So the Baba Link area is the area around the Amish country. These people are ace birders, and they report it. So this is the daily number you can call if you want to know what's happening in Ashland Carroll, all those different counties in and around the, um, the Amish area. You dial that number and Robert Hershberger or sometimes his brother Mike or his cousin Michael will come on and they will give you a live phone message of what's being seen where. And they're very specific, giving you addresses you can look at and all kind of cool information like that. So um, I think that's the last of mine, and I tried to hit as many things, and I'm sorry if I um, echoed some of the boys' thoughts, but let me tell you this. I will bring up, and I heard um, uh, Tom talking about the place he used the bird that was north of um, the Brown Stadium. Guess what? Go there now. Go there now. So on Saturday, I just happened to run into a celebrity birder. I was doing the Chagrin River Bird Quest um, with five of the bird nerds. And our first stop, of course, was Wendy. And there was this little girl there. I think her name is J.B. 
And so when you see a girl named JB, you go. And in one tree, in 90 minutes, we had 12 warbler species. It was just crazy. Our next stop was Erie Street. Erie Street was killing it. And then we went to that little tree line just north of the, of the Brown Stadium. All there is is a few trees along the parking lot. Here's the thing I will tell you about this. It's a small green area with no green area, and the trees are small, so we had ridiculous look at birds. In that little strip, we had 12 species of warblers in less than an hour. And the greatest thing about it, there's no tree over 30 feet tall. They're all about 20 feet tall, so they were just in and in. So we ended up on Saturday with 18 species of warblers with the bird nerds. And, of, of course, thanks a lot to JB because she was just calling out. And I don't know if she's a magnet or what, but I'm telling you, head to these little areas that we're talking about. So check out that area north of the Brown Stadium if you think there's going to be a warbler. To, and it's small trees, and there's not very many of them. You can walk it back and forth in, in easily 20 minutes and see if it's worth it or not. So, guys, I apologize for not being there the whole time. I hope I didn't repeat too many things. And I'm going to hang up now and hear what you guys have to say. Thank you. No apologies needed, Buster. I, I really, really, really think you need to ramp up your enthusiasm a bit, you know. I could kind of tell you were really slugging. No, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I could tell just just that, just being out and, you know, you be with the bird nerds, you with yourself, you with uh, another visitor or a guest, just as all, all of the others have mentioned, um, we want you to get out there. And that's why we, Western Cuyahoga, has put out these challenges um, so that you can become a better birder. You can go out with friends, uh, again, in small groups. Remember the COVID precautions. Uh, we want you to become a better birder. We want you to connect with others. We want you to join in and, again, talk with these fabulous folks that we've had on here tonight. Uh, I don't know if anybody has a, a final uh, word, either Tim or Tim. we got Tim Tim on the line. Does anyone have any questions? Like, I know we have some people in the, in the crowd. Uh, does anyone have any questions they can throw in the chat for us? I'd have a ton of questions if I were, if I had Buster and Tim on the line. That those those two are amazing girders. That that's uh, you know, Nancy, everybody, all you guys are awesome. So that's why uh, I'd have a bunch of questions. Well, while we're waiting for questions, um, I, I I'd like to just follow up on uh, what Nancy was talking about and. You know, looking for habitat, um, I think she mentioned uh, the fact that, you know, mixed habitat provides lots of opportunity for different species. Um, you know, getting to understand where to look. Tim mentioned earlier about, you know, when you understand the behaviors of some of these warblers, you know not only what you're looking for as far as trying to identify the bird, but you know its behavior so you know where you're likely to see the bird and separating the bird uh, sort of by the height at which you'd see it is just one way. Uh, Tim also mentioned the fact that um, some of these birds wag their tails. Um, the more time you spend with them, the more of a sense you get as to how they behave. Perhaps um, you see a bird um, flitting and spreading its tail a lot and kind of spreading its wings. And you get the sense that that might be a red start because of the way that it the way that it moves. So those are all keys. But when we talked about habitat, uh, and I keep checking the chat for a question, but when we talk about habitat, one of the things I wanted to go back and mention is that as you're birding in the in the fall uh, and the spring, and quite frankly any time, but during migration particularly, look for those habitats, the edges of habitats where two different habitats come together. So where a field might meet uh, a set of trees, a woodland, look right along that edge because you uh, might find that the birds will um, work those edges. And the same thing with corridors, natural corridors, uh, or maybe not so natural corridors. Oh, um, if you're in a park that had maybe an old service road that doesn't get used, so it's grown, but there's still a gap 
um, between trees that often can be productive. So those edges of habitats often are very, very productive, um, particularly in migration when um, birds are um, looking to refuel quickly and are, are you know, perhaps a little more active. I'm going to add on to that a uh, good place I tend to look is again a power line corridor where, where the trees have been removed yet shrubs have grown up, grapevines, so, so you have a forest, you have maybe some grasses and forbs and shrubs but you've got fruiting bushes that I find that sometimes very good not just for warblers but for a lot of other migrants. But I also see we have a, a question in the chat. Uh, can you tell us about the habitat of water thrush warblers? Uh, where should I look for them? So uh, both of the water thrush are, are common along slow-moving uh, creeks and streams. Um, you know, you can see them in downtown Cleveland and Erie Street Cemetery, um, or any of the, the migrant traps that they stop on, but typical habitat of those birds would be you know, um, would be along water, you know, hence the name water thrush, and they look like a thrush because they got those spots in their belly. Um, they're actually a warbler, though. Um, small, small creeks. Um, I know in the Caga Valley that Tim mentioned earlier um, where a station road is, um, I've often seen uh, Louisiana, Louisiana water thrush there, um, unfortunately feeding cowbird chicks fish out of the stream. So um, the little old canal, the old canal on the other side of the river, um, I was watching um, a Louisiana water thrush grab minnows and feed a cowbird chick one year. Um, so um, any little small moving creek or stream, um, and one I had mentioned in Huntington Reservation, I always see both species of, of those there. So that's a great place to look. And I'll add that um, if there's a slight difference in habitat, it is that Louisiana prefers maybe a little faster moving stream and that northern water thrushes prefer slower moving water or standing water. So that, that may help um, you de kind of determine um, habitat one from the other. Um, but as Tim said, they're both water, hence the name, water loving warblers. I see, I see that Buster's um, thrown in that um, out east at the Holden Arboretum and near Kirtland, um, they have breeding Louisiana water thrushes there uh, and uh, fairly good numbers uh, every year. So I agree, that's a great spot to see them. Um, there are not many breeding areas in northern Ohio for Louisiana water thrush. One what thing um, I, I didn't... Oh, sorry, Nancy, go ahead. Oh, I just want to mention one thing that makes Ohio kind of unique is that we're kind of at a crossroads where we have to the east, we're thinking Lake, Geauga, Ashtabula County. You've got some of those northern habitats, some of those ravines that, that can attract some different species. You head a little bit to the west, into Lorraine County. You're getting into some of the agricultural, the grassland areas. Buster mentioned going down towards uh, the Amish country, you know, Tuscaroras and Wayne counties where, where you start getting some of those southern warbler species. Uh, so again, we're, we're just right at this interesting junction right here in Northeast Ohio where you get a nice variety of plants and, and, and wildlife. One thing I was going to mention that we didn't talk about uh, yet is I got a huge echo for some reason. Um, is is the call notes uh, call notes song? That's one thing that that we could really research to try to narrow down what species we have. And obviously, the, the, they they sing more in the spring. Um, but if you learn their chip notes, which are not easy. Um, but you could identify um, certain warbler species just by their chip notes. Uh, so it's always always good to to learn their their songs and calls as well. Yeah, I'll I'll just add if uh, uh, quickly that um, you know we've talked about a number of resources in researching where to look for these warblers and how to find them. But for those that are trying to um, learn 
uh, how to identify them in addition to being in the field. To me, that's the best teacher is spending time in the field and actually going out, spending the time patiently going through these warblers, trying to identify the field marks and identify the birds is to use a traditional field guide either online or in book format. And um, we have some very, very good warbler guides available. The, the warbler, there is a book called The Warbler Guide. It's out, just out for the last um, six, eight years, I think now. Uh, and that is just a, a, a terrific visual guide to help us understand um, not only um, how these birds can appear to us in the field and how to identify them based on their field marks, but um, for those of us that are trying to become better uh, learners of the, the songs and calls, um, they delve deeply into sonograms, which are the visual interpretations of those songs, and explain the differences so that um, if you do have access to listening to chip notes, and those are available through the internet, as Buster pointed out, all this information available through Google. You know, just just Google a bird, and um, you know, go to a site where you can listen to those songs. Or if you have a an, an, an app on your phone with with those songs, you can listen to them, and open up the Warbler Guide and look at those accompanying sonograms, and and you can those are tools that you can use to become more familiar with songs and how they're represented on a sonogram, an image, and um, that can be a, a real express way into learning um, to understand both songs and call notes. And as Tim points out, uh, in the fall, that's going to be a huge help to being able to separate these birds. Uh, one of the, our, our viewers mentions they like to take photos of the birds and then when they come back home, look things up, uh, we do a little bit more research, which is a, a great idea. I know several people who do that. Uh, Buster mentioned the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, all about birds. I just had to go there uh, yesterday because I was getting all kinds of fly catchers at Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve and the call notes of these fly catchers, whether it was Acadian or least or the, the other emphids, ah, so I'm listening and listening and I'm trying my best just to get through the fly catchers. We're just going to work on word now. So. Wow. Yeah, I, I, that was, I think that, that was that, a lot um, of information. That was fabulous. Yeah, I, I would uh, second the. Uh, um, thumbs up for All About Birds and Cornell Lab's uh, site. That's their site, but um, Cornell Lab has a lot of other information as well, but in uh, trying to learn sort of their online bird guide, All About Birds has a ton of information and a lot of good comparative photos, a lot of information about their songs and calls. It's a good site. Very good. All righty. We're going to wrap this up, gentlemen. We're going to wrap it up, visitors. Thank you so much for this evening, for your time, for your expertise. Uh, we, hopefully we'll run into you out in the field. And thank you, viewers, for, for coming in. I hope you picked up some, some tips. Um, again, please be sure to check out the Western Cuyahoga website and some of the sites that were uh, links on this uh, presentation. Remember, this was recorded. It will be uh, going on to uh, YouTube, and so you can listen to it again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Have everybody. Good evening. Thanks. Thank you.